hey, join me to take a first look at a new feature coming to Blender's geometry nodes called closures. This new feature is coming to Blender 5, which is currently in alpha. And we're gonna jump right into geometry nodes and talk about this a little bit. Let me delete everything and put in a monkey so we have a little bit of an interesting mesh to start with and create a new geometry nodes node tree. Okay, so I'm a software engineer and when we write a program, we use a programming language, which is usually just plain text. And then we write the lines of code and it is being executed top to bottom. Now, geometry nodes is a sort of a program language. It is a visual programming and it is being executed, as we all know, from left to right, from inputs to outputs. In computer programs, we usually create reusable components like uh, functions, procedures, methods, whatever you want to call them. They contain the code that performs a certain action and that code has some input parameters. It does something and then it creates an output. Inside of geometry nodes, we have the same thing. Each node is actually a subroutine or let's just call it function from now on. So if I plug in a set position node in here, this is now a function. It has input parameters on the left and it creates an output on the right. Internally, it has the code to perform whatever the function is that this node is supposed to perform. So every node is a function. And this one we know is a loop and it does something on each and every vertex of our input mesh. If the input geometry is a curve, then it's uh, performing the set position on the curve uh, points. Or if it's a point cloud, then of course it's doing it on the points of the point cloud. So all of these nodes that we can add in geometry nodes, those are functions. We can create our own functions. Uh, and uh, so far you've known these as node groups. So let's create a really simple function. For example, let's deform Suzanne by plugging a random vector into the offset. Of course, this is a bit much, maybe still a bit much. And now we are deforming Suzanne with a random vector. Now imagine this is the coolest node group that you've ever created, the coolest function. Uh, right now it's just two nodes, but we can put these into a group Hitting, selecting both and hitting Ctrl G, which creates a node group with our two nodes. And outside, we now have a new function with input, with output, and inside, it does something. It is very simple, but still, we could call this the deform function. Okay, so we have created cool new function. Uh, what else could we do? We could take Suzanne, and again, you know what, let's just do another set position, and... We set a new position based on the current position and we plug in a blur attribute node, which is actually a really cool setup, by the way, to create a smooth, a smooth modifier. So we are blurring the position attribute, which smooths out the surface, right? Now this is a cool function. We could take uh, these three nodes create a new node group, leave the node group and call it smooth. So we created another cool function that we can use. Now let's pretend we're doing something really complex. So we're doing something in the front here, we're doing something complex in the back here, and in the middle we want to plug in our functions. So just for demonstration purposes, let's do a transform geometry and imagine that this is really complex, complex. Okay, so probably hundreds of nodes and noodles right here. Again, back here, we're gonna do, uh, I don't know, set material. Um, again, imagine that this is really a complex node setup here. And in between, we now put in our deform node. Awesome. Now, since this stuff is super complex and we created the best node tree that performs the coolest operation. Of course, we want to put it into another group. So we group, so let's group that, and jump out and call it complex. Awesome. So we created this function that is doing something very complicated, but we can now not tell that 
Inside, it's actually using one of our cool functions that we created earlier, in this case, the deform function. Right? We can't, see, we can't tell, we can't see it outside. We have to go into this node group. Imagine there's hundreds of nodes and noodles. We have to know exactly where to look, where to find this. And if we want to change it, for example, we don't want the deform, maybe we want the smooth, we have to take this out, put in the smooth group and plug that in here. So if you create reusable components, like geometry nodes, node groups, and you want your users to be able to change the functionality inside, this really kind of sucks, right? I mean, how are your users going to know in this complex node tree where to look, what to change, what to detach, what to put in, what other nodes there are that they can plug in here. Yeah, out here we can't really tell what's inside and we can't change it unless we know exactly what's happening in there. Wouldn't it be just super duper nice if we could somehow take our smooth function and kind of plug it in there and say, you know what, complex no tree, you're doing great stuff and at the, some point inside of your whole entire workflow, use my smooth function. Or if we don't want the, the smooth, maybe we want the deform, then we plug that one in here. Wouldn't that be like super amazing? And in here, the creator of this very complex node tree could say, okay, here, instead of um, performing a specific function, we want to perform something that has been plugged in by the user. And that is exactly what closures are for. So many modern programming languages have some sort of concept of closures. Before we can create our own first closure, we have to talk about data types though. Let's go back to our set position node. You can see there's different colors here. These colors uh, represent the data type of the input and output. So this one is a very complex one. Actually, it's a geometry node, can be mesh, could be a point cloud, could be a curve. Um, this one is a field of booleans. This one is a field of vectors and so on and so forth. Let's get a math node in here. The math node is like the OG function because it's a ma mathematical function. A plus B equals C. And here we have floating point numbers. So this is that. If we use a vector math node, for example, then the input type is a vector. So we have different data types. Numbers, integers, floats, vectors, booleans, geometry, and uh, many others in a Blender. And when we connect two nodes, two functions, with a noodle, that noodle, you could think of that noodle sort of as containing, in this case, a vector. This noodle here contains geometry. Okay, now how can we plug a function into another function? Well, we kind of need the data type of a function, and that's exactly the closure. So before you can use that, you gotta go to the preferences in Blender 5, remember, Blender 5. You go to the uh, interface, you enable developer extras, and then this menu shows up, experimental, and here you can enable the bundle and closure nodes. That's what you need. By the way, this one is also enabled. I have videos here on the channel. This is also a very cool new feature coming to Blender. So you enable the bundle and closure nodes, and then you can go Shift A, you can uh, look for closure and you can see closure. And when you do that, you get a closure zone. Sort of looks like a node group, doesn't it? Hmm. So what does a closure do? Well, it's just a function definition. Let's recreate our smooth. The smooth was a set position node based on geometry. So we need some sort of closure input. Our function input has to be geometry. And then inside we said we're going to set uh, the position to uh, the position and we will blur that attribute. And the output is again geometry. And you can see here the output of our closure zone is a closure. Closure is a new data type. And this noodle coming out of here means the content of this noodle 
isn't an integer or a floating point or a boolean or a vector or a geometry. It is a function. Okay? And how do we execute this function? Well, there's another node. It is the evaluate closure. And you can see I drag it out. It creates an evaluate closure node. And since it knows that the closure needs geometry as its input, it already gives me geometry as an input. And it knows we're creating a geometry as an output. We get a geometry node output. So this is the execution of this. Okay, so we, we're taking the definition of our function away from the point of execution. We can move the point of execution now wherever we want. So this is our closure. This will be the smooth closure. And let's say inside of our complex node tree, let me copy this, remove it from here. Let's go in here and paste it in here. Plug it in there. Geometry, geometry. Of course, now this node needs to know which closure, which function to execute. So we need to plug it into our uh, group. Now you can see our complex node tree has a sort of a plugin and we can plug in our smooth closure. Works just fine. We don't need these groups. We're using closures. Let's talk about YouTube for a minute. I know every creator asks you to subscribe to their channel, but maybe you've noticed it doesn't really matter. If a YouTuber tells you to subscribe so you don't miss any future videos, that is simply not true. If you've watched videos by that creator in the past, the YouTube algorithm is smart enough to show you new videos anyway, since you've already shown interest in that channel. So when I ask you to subscribe to my channel, you're not really doing it for your convenience. You're mostly doing it for two reasons. First, a growing subscriber count is very inspiring and motivating for me to create more videos for you. And second, my goal has always been to reach 100,000 subscribers to get the silver play button. Others have proven that it is not difficult to reach that number with pure entertainment or even AI slop, but I always thought or hoped that no-nonsense educational videos about things that I find extremely interesting and captivating might also be good enough to reach that milestone. And one of those silver YouTube play buttons would be proof of that. And it would just look so good up on that shelf back there. The stats show that the majority of my viewers are not subscribed. But maybe you could do me a favor and hit that subscribe button and make my dream come true. Thank you. Now let's create another closure. Shift A, closure, gives us this. What did we do? We wanted a uh, geometry, uh, ah, deform. Yeah, right, deform, so set position again. Uh, we're gonna get input uh, geometry, output geometry, and we're gonna do an offset as a random value, a vector between zero and 0 0.2. So we have a different closure, and now we can use our complex node tree, but instead of plugging this closure in, we plug this closure in, and we still get all of the complex stuff that this node tree can do, but at a certain point in the entire workflow, we can execute our plugin function that we defined. So this is extremely cool. Just imagine that this complex stuff in here could be a simulation zone, and we could evaluate this closure inside here for each frame of our animation. So whatever you can think of, this is now the point of execution of a function you define somewhere else. Okay, let's go back out. So how can we make this a little bit more uh, user-friendly? Because now we defined our function here, and maybe we want to provide this as uh, like a nice little node group. You know what? First of all, let's get rid of these. Let's take all of this, put it inside a node group. The group does not have an input because it's a closure, but it has an output and the group output is a closure. So now we have a nice little group and that one would be the, the smooth closure. So now we have a nice little node which just gives us the smooth closure. We plug it in, it's smoothing out the mesh. Okay, let's put this stuff into a group Again, group doesn't have any input, but it has the closure as an output. So now this group also outputs a function or a closure. 
this would be the deform closure and we can plug that one in instead. So now we created a cool little plugin system where we removed the definition from the execution. Now there's two different things. This now contains the function to execute and this node actually executes the function. These are node groups that create a closure and this function might want to expose some attributes so we can change them out here. For example, our deform node, you might want to expose this max value and you just plug it into the group input. Actually, now you have to decide if you want to put it into the group input or the closure input. By putting it into the group input out here, we can now change the deform size. What if we plug that max into the closure input and we don't have this max on the group input? This now means we have to set the max attribute on the evaluate closure node. So we would have to put the max in here. So depending on what your goal is here, you decide if you want to plug it into the group input or the closure. I think it makes more sense to do it out here in the group input. So we can change the value here and then hand off this function to this function. And if we duplicate that and we create much larger values and we use this closure, then we have different values. Of course, same thing in here, the smooth closure uh, node group, this one. So maybe you want to expose the iterations and the weight again into the group input. And then we can plug those, this closure in here, can increase the iterations and play with the weight. So now I'm sure you're thinking, how do I combine these two? So that in here, we're evaluating two closures. Uh, well, one way, the, the stupid way, would be to plug in another evaluate closure node and then expose another closure here. And then we have two sockets here and we could plug in the second one down here. And the smart and easy solution for this, of course, is to just create another closure. So we create another closure, which is another function. We know that these two closures operate on geometry. So this closure will have to have a geometry input. So just hit plus gives us a geometry input. Then maybe we want to deform first. So what can we do here? We can evaluate this closure on this geometry. And then we want to smooth. So let's put that down here. Again, we evaluate this closure on this geometry. And the output of this closure is this geometry. And we plug this closure in here. So now we're deforming. Let's see if it works. Let's deform a lot. Yes. And then we're smoothing and it works. This is how we combine multiple closures. We just create a new closure and evaluate other closures inside. Now I've talked about the simulation zones before and with these closures, I think we're going to be one step closer to particle nodes because just imagine we have a simulation zone in here maybe and we give that complex node tree a closure that handles, I don't know, reflections, collisions, uh, gravity, whatever you can think of or maybe even the emission. We create a closure, we plug it into an emission closure socket, and then our particle system complex node tree handles or uses that emission of closure for emitting particles. And it uses uh, effect closures for like collisions and stuff. I hope this explains to you what closures are. Closure, the new data type, it means that in this noodle, we now don't have a value, like a number, a boolean. In this noodle, we now have a function definition and we execute that function with the evaluate closure node. Now there's another new data type and maybe you've seen this uh, when we enabled this one here, bundle and closure nodes. And the, new the other new data type is the bundle. And I'm going to talk about bundles in another video. This is my first look at closures in geometry nodes in Blender 5. If you learned something new, please like the video. If you enjoyed this video, 
consider watching another one. Subscribe and support below. Thanks for watching. See ya.